Hi everybody, how's it going? Welcome to Sliding Into My DMs, part of the D4 Network. This is the show on the network where we talk about D&D rules, where we talk about D&D news, and we talk about how to... This is the part that I always struggle with. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Advice for mm-hmm. making sure that everybody is having as much fun as possible at your table. How about that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Good. Yeah, sounds good for yeah. DMs yeah. and players. Mm-hmm. I, I think sometimes people might think that this is like a show for DMs, and sometimes the topics can be a little DM focused, but mm-hmm. I don't think of yeah. it that way personally. It's just it's like, because we've all DM. Because it's right? because you are my DMs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Even though, well, anyway, yes. Um, so, welcome. Happy to have you. Uh, my name's Colby. And Thanks for coming. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm your host, and with me uh, are some of my DMs. So we have Tori. Hi, Tori. Oh, hi. And Dallin. And Corey. I'm afraid that today you've been race changed to a goblin. I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> w- Interesting. Why? I don't know. I'm the DM. I can do okay. what I want. Right. I'm the grand poo <laughs> of goblins. That's right. <laughs> well, not a lot of... Not a lot of channel news, I don't think. Drake Warden? Yeah, that's your latest, yeah, right? Yeah, pretty the, cool. The, the new Fizz Band stuff has been doing well. Not surprisingly, the monk has been underperforming. <laughs> <laughs> Do you Par mean like the, the build underperformed or uh, just both. the... Okay, all both. right. <laughs> yeah. So, um, as usual, there are a couple of things that I want to talk with you guys about. We've got a quick ruling and then we've got a deeper dive. Yes. Uh, as it were. Thank you for that for that nomenclature, Corey. You're welcome. Um, but I've got, got tons of them <laughs> in my pocket here. So, quick ruling for this week. Let's jump in. Um, I want to talk about Booming Blade, which seems oh, to hang be... hang on. Nope. The last time we did a Booming Blade where I was on the show, uh-huh. I got a lot of flack for it. Did you? <laughs> yes. I don't even remember it what was, it was. It was the... Uh, it was the moving opportunity attack booming mm, blade yeah. and uh, i had i had quite a fun discussion with a few people <laughs> on your comment sections because Uh-oh. they didn't agree with me that's because um, they're so all this optimizers who are always asking for favors from True. their dms mm-hmm. yep i have to deal with them all the time <laughs> i don't know what that's sorry i had him, I had, I had mean? him. Yes. just yes. one of them right. yeah. just one right. Right. um Continue. Okay. I apologize. That's okay. Um, I, I do. I do bring up booming blade a lot because a. I like the spell. B. I tend to use it in my builds semi frequently. C. I think it's powerful. And D. It raises a lot of questions. I think a lot of the times, uh, rules wise. Um, so here's what I want to ask about today. Can I use the booming blade cantrip if my hands are full with? either two weapons or a sword and a shield. Um, and I don't have the Warcaster feat. So for reference, Booming Blade, um, if you look up the spell, you'll notice that it has both a material and a somatic component. Mm-hmm. The material component we're made to understand is the weapon itself. At least one silver piece. Yes, that's worth at least one silver piece, which is why it gets into questions with um, Shadow Blade. We've right. talked about that in the past. Mm-hmm. See there. Um, but anyway, <laughs> it's, it's there. Yeah. You yeah. can't see it. And it, it I'm gonna take your word for it. It's there. Yeah. Trust me. That's uh, is an illusion, and I'm just able to mm-hmm. see through the illusion. Yeah, you right. Yeah. You okay. succeeded on your check. Perfect. Yeah. Um, okay, so you brandish the weapon used in the spell's casting and make a melee attack with it against one creature within five feet of you, and then other things. But that, to me, is like the important passage here that Mm -hmm. sticks out, right? Um, And then, just to refresh everybody's memory, as far as somatic components are concerned, we are told this in the player's handbook. Spellcasting gestures might include a forceful gesticulation. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, thank you. Please demonstrate, (laughs) Dallin. Or an intricate set so of scary. or an intricate set of gestures. <laughs> that is that took longer than six seconds. Sorry. So your turn's no, over. I think it was right at six. It was right at the cusp. If a spell requires a somatic component, the caster must have free use of at least one hand to perform these gestures. Okay, and that's where we get into the tricky part. That is the crux. The right. So Ooh. I have a weapon in this hand, and I have a weapon in this hand. I do not have the Warcaster feat, which says you can cast spells that have somatic components even though your hands are full, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. 
So my hands are just full. Booming blade requires a somatic component. I do not have a free hand. I guess what I'm really wondering is, does the phrase, you know, you brandish the weapon used in the spell's casting and make a melee attack with it, is that flavor text? Is it like, like what if I don't want to brandish the weapon? Like, I'm just going to point it at somebody or I'm not going to brandish it. Like, it it's almost seems to me like, like the brandishing the weapon is the somatic component or maybe making the attack is the somatic component. Um, and then we've got the material component covered and voila, spell. But maybe I'm wrong. So I don't know. I, I, as usual, I want to know what you think rules as written are and how you would rule it at your table. I'll go last. Sounds like a good idea. Okay. okay, so first of all, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Do the other smite spells have a somatic component with them? Spells, spells, you probably know the answer to this, but let's pretend that you don't. <laughs> You're shouting it at your screen right now. <laughs> a searing smite, for example. Nope, verbal component only. Verbal component only. Um, let me just double check. Thunderous smite, verbal component only. Mm -hmm. Branding smite, verbal component only. Okay. So the implication there is that Booming Blade was made with a somatic component for a reason. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty much anything that is in that first beginning part is flavor text. That That isn't anything that's like required you for the spell. You don't have to brandish your you, you weapon if you don't want to. You don't have to brandish your weapon. Or <laughs> I think there are some spells that talk about you pull an owl feather out of somewhere and, you know, kind of thing. Out sure. of yeah. where? Somewhere. Fireball yeah. has guana. <laughs> Only the monk knows. Yeah. Well, those are, those are the material components right. that you could yeah. potentially but substitute a... Yeah. But, and there, but there's just certain, so there's just certain spells that, things. like describe things like that as a as a hey isn't this a cool idea for your character to get you thinking about it yeah yeah um i think as far as it would go i'll, I'll be the bad guy again because it is a booming blade sure as far as Here comes rules the comments. as written go i think you ha like you would need to have, have a, free a hand, hand free. or the warcaster or, feet right yeah so i i think i think rules is written it would have to be you would have to have a hand free until you took the warcaster feet because again, it's one of those. It's one of those. Why have the feet if you can just like circumvent it for the most part? Um, as far as my table goes, I don't see any problem with the doing a, a quick flourish and having the booming blade like activate with that flourish, sure. or or having the shield in your hand and you know s smashing your sword against the shield, or even like running two blades against each other to kind of spark that magic. Right, like, right, that's right. all. That's all really cool, and yeah. that overrides any sort of issue that I would have with not having the Warcaster feet for that particular spell. Okay. Other spells like Scorching Ray or things like that, sure. like, you'll need that for those spells, but anything that requires a an actual weapon, no. I actually didn't even know that Booming Blade required a silver piece weapon. I was like, mm -hmm. I was fully ready, like Shadow Blade, whatever. Yeah. So, thank you. No, that helps me in I'm the future. sad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You're Tori? gonna be sad again because I came to the same conclusion as no. Tori. For reals. Okay. Wow. When you read that text mm -hmm. that says you have to have a free hand, mm -hmm. I think that that spells it out pretty clearly. Mm -hmm. Okay. But again, I I'm on the same page as Corey at my table. At your table. Of course, I'd let you do that. Yeah. yeah. That, that's nothing. The the rules. Like for the rules are there for a balanced game, yeah. And as a DM, it's your job to if something like if you want to unbalance it one way, you just tweak something else over here to make sure. it fair, you know, kind of thing. Sure. Yeah, but I mean, as far as that's the whole reason why we do the rules as written is like, as far as Raw is concerned, you need to have the most balanced game possible and follow the rules because that's what they're there for. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're just telling stories, right? right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, I'm a DM Down. of the people, of the players. <laughs> so there was an errata to spellcasting oh. when Tasha's came out. And this is what it says. The final paragraph in the player's handbook about material components now reads, a spellcaster must have a free hand to access a spell's material components or to hold a spellcasting focus, uh, but it can be the same hand that he or she uses to perform somatic components. So material component is the sword, mm -hmm. and you can use that hand to do your somatic okay. component. Alrighty. According to the errata. Uh, mm. the, the official errata, yeah. I'll, I'll go ahead and so change my I redact I my opinion. Exactly. Yep, that's, yes. Yep. I well, did it! You, you just wanted to show us up, didn't you? No, I just wanted to, you know, be on the right side <laughs> of 
No, I mean, D&D yeah. history. Obviously, like, when a question like that comes up, getting getting a... Uh, <laughs> Getting a uh, a note from Jeremy Crawford on on his interpretation of the right, day, sure. you know, he gets a random tweet and he's just like, I don't know, like, <laughs> uh, make like make something something up and hands it out. Yeah, you know, like that's one thing. Yeah. But when it's an official, like this has come up enough that Wizards is like, no, we need, we need to put to a, a correction here. to the rule in the next book to come to come out. Like, yeah, that's perfectly fine. Okay, yeah. So well, I think you can. There you have it. How does Kobe feel? So good. <laughs> <laughs> so what build are you doing with this now? <laughs> um, should I do a little spoiler for next week? Or maybe a tease. I mean, it's, you won hard enough. That was a natural 20 on his that history. Is, that is. <gasps> or investigate. <laughs> your, yes, your investigation check. Uh, uh, it's it's going to be a two-weapon fighting focused Eldritch Knight. Ooh, um, okay. Mixed with a little another subclass that I'm not going to tell you. Okay, oh, how? I think I knew answer this me one. this: Is the majority of your class levels in Eldritch Knight? Yes. Okay, good. Because <laughs> sometimes you can call it and only yes. take up to three levels in yeah. Eldritch Knight. Hey, once you get the subclass, it's yours. Yep. <laughs> it's mostly Eldritch Knight. Okay, cool. I'll say that. So, I'm excited. Anyway. I built a character the other day that is a bard that does not have proficiency in persuasion or mm-hmm. any sort of social or skills. Or any char- charisma. Yep. Mm-hmm. yep. So, uh, so like two reverse. sides of the table here. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but he's the, fun the and I want to play him. optimized <laughs> Uh, yeah, look bar. out for my new channel, D&D Unoptimized. <laughs> D&D Unoptimized. Yep. That is awesome. I can't wait to Duo. see it. I will laugh when he dies. Oh, yeah. He'll <laughs> <laughs> be the first one dead. Or she. No, persuasion they. doesn't keep you alive, he, no, necessarily. That's true. He's a he. That's okay. true. All right. Well, thank you. Especially down there. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, that, no that was yeah. That was no, no thanks. thanks to us. That was just thanks to. <laughs> no, Dallas. it was thank you to everyone, mm-hmm. especially Dallas. <laughs> All right, let's. Uh, Can you tell who the favorite is here? <laughs> we don't play favorites. That's not professional at your table. Don't do that. Treat everyone the same. That's Hint: right. It goes in order from how far you are away from Colby. Oh, man. <laughs> All that work for nothing. Uh-huh. Wait, wait. Switch it. Switch it up. Like you moved up a rank. You went down a rank. Yeah, you know, sorry, Tori. I'm going to ask for the move. Okay. I can't really All right. fit around this corner. It's a tight. And then we go to ad break, and when we come back, they're swapped. Yeah, that would be funny. <laughs> All right. Now it's time for the deep dive topic. Splash. <laughs> <laughs> I love how that was like what I made. <laughs> so today I want to talk to you guys about railroading. Okay. Railroading, or, um, or or maybe uh, like linear storytelling, or um, you know, you hear people sometimes talk about like how their D and D game can feel like you're on a roller coaster or an amusement park. Like you, you know, you're on the rails, so you're fun. on the rails, and like you're not getting off, right? You're in one of those, and the DM, you're in one of those really crappy haunted houses that they have <laughs> in the amusement parks. Yeah, and we all, we over. all know the one, <laughs> and and you as a player might want to go check out what's going on at the harbor, but nope, you're going to the slums because mm-hmm. that's the story that the DM prepared, and he didn't prepare anything for the harbor, so that's where you're going. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That kind of thing, right? Where where the DM is basically um, kind of. I don't want to say forcing, but maybe strongly encouraging the the plot to to go a certain way. So I think I think right there's an important distinction about railroading. Okay. Because a game can strongly encourage you one direction mm-hmm. without being a railroading without campaign. Forcing it, yeah. Yeah, but it's when it. It's when you're actually forced to do something to go a specific direction, like when the DM is basically like, "No, you guys, you guys can't go here. Right. You need to go this direction." Right. That's when it becomes railroading, proper. okay? Because otherwise, like, uh, like there's a lot of situations where I'm like, I literally have this like nice neat path mm-hmm. of clues that I've set out for my players, and they follow them exactly, and it's like, is that railroading? But the right. answer is. Probably not. No, it might be breadcrumbs. Yeah. It's breadcrumbing. It's breadcrumbing is encouraged. <laughs> Delicious. Yeah. <laughs> so just, your player is just walking down like a piece of candy. Yeah, just a piece of candy. <laughs> but and but but of course the of, witch's house. Yep. <laughs> but but of course there's there's probably nuances there, right? And yes, there's and there's definitely. some like there there's like Here's your breadcrumbs, and if you don't pick this up, you don't have anything else to eat. Mm-hmm. And there's, you know, here's some breadcrumbs, but like, 
if you wanted to go somewhere else, you could, and we can deal with that. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And yeah. and there's probably you know yeah. flavors of that and variation. I think it's a like a like a scale, right? You have like free sandbox on this side and like completely on rails on this right. side. Mm-hmm. So right. I think most games are try to in find there. something in between. Right. And then and then sometimes um, you have your players in the middle. And you have your plot all around them, kind of encircling them, mm-hmm. and it's they will get to the plot no matter which direction they go. Sure, you know, and that's that's a different. It, it's not exactly railroading, but it is a different type of railroading. Being right. like, yeah. being behind the scenes, knowing that no matter which direction they go, if they go to the harbor, that's where the bandits are going to be. Yeah. If they decide to go to the tavern, that's where the bandits are sure. going to be. You know, sure. like, and some other things might happen along the way, mm-hmm. but um, something different than maybe would have happened at the harbor. Yeah. Right. If they go to the tavern, um, but it still allows for choice. Well, okay. So I don't want to get too far ahead of myself here. Yes. Um, I want to talk about now that we've sort of defined what it is a little bit. I want to talk about why we do it um, as DMs, <laughs> and and maybe kind of get at a little bit of like when is it more appropriate? When is it not appropriate? Some people might think it's never appropriate. Some mm-hmm. people might think that it's okay in these certain situations. So I kind of want to get at that yeah. and then um, and then move on at the end to if you're going to do it whether heavy-handed or not even if with, a, with a light touch how do you do it in a way that maybe doesn't make your players feel like they're being railroaded or that it is a light touch and that it is maybe infrequent or whatever mm-hmm. um, so let's start with the kind of the why and the like when um, as a DM and I can't really speak to this, frankly. <laughs> so you tell me. As a DM, why do you railroad your players if and when you do? I'll go last. Okay. Because <laughs> apparently we can call that now. <laughs> oh. I well, I just first. wanted that awesome moment to be like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I have an aha moment. You don't know. Well, cool. I want one later, so I'll go first. <laughs> <laughs> to be wrong, I guess. Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. I think that's a really difficult question to answer because I do think the thing I find the most beautiful about playing D&D is that you as a player get to be part of a story that you're helping craft. Mm -hmm. Um, But I can also appreciate as a DM that it takes a ton of work Mm -hmm. to build a session. Yeah. And it can be a tiny bit frustrating when you're like, well, this is what I had planned for tonight. Mm -hmm. Right. And then everyone's just like, we're going to go play with the fairies like it's <laughs> I always like, okay. for the record that's like verbatim a mm-hmm. quote from me on <laughs> several <laughs> sessions with the fairies. we're gonna go play with the fairies <laughs> that's why you always have a fairy side mission planned when yes, exactly. you run a game for Colby exactly. and frolicking he's gonna be summoning a fae at some point uh-huh. and it's gonna lead him on a wild goose chase yep. anyway facts so <laughs> I think that As Corey already alluded to here, I think it's appropriate that if you do have, like, an important story beat that you need to get to, to give them the illusion that, yeah, we're going to play with the fairies, and, (laughs) but we're still going to do what I had planned. Wouldn't you know it, the fairies have some corrupting influence on them that was supposed to be over here and start. fairies. Mm -hmm. It's a plague. So, I think, for the sake of the DM, sometimes... It's, it's appropriate because you're just like, oh, man, like we really need to get to the next part because this is dragging on forever. Sure. Mm-hmm. But in the same breath, it's really fun to go off the rails. Like it is so fun. And I feel like like I think back to Storm King's Thunder and some of my favorite like moments that we've had in that mm-hmm. campaign have been totally off the rails. Yeah. Like just ad lib. Ad yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so it does require a little bit more of the DM to be like, okay, I'm flexible, I'm creative, I can make this happen, like, yeah. let's go off the rails here. Yeah. But also having that finesse to still kind of make it happen. So, But again, is that railroading? I don't really think so, because I think it's just propelling the story forward. Yeah, right. Yeah, there's definitely degrees. Yes. And, and yeah. maybe, maybe we need to sort of say... When, when we're talking about railroading, I, I don't, I don't think... you have no choice. Yeah, I don't think any DM, yeah. frankly, except for maybe v- the very inexperienced first-timers and or playing at mm-hmm. a table where the players are like, we want you to railroad us, right? Yeah. Would, like, just be 100%, nope, like, 
we're just on a train and there's no getting off until we reach our destination and if you want to go that way i'm not going to let you kind of thing yeah. right you have um, three doors to, so this is railroad you have three doors to open okay we'll open the first door it's locked okay the second one it's locked the third door yep it's open yeah, like exactly now is that different and not to get too off topic but is that different than they all are unlocked but they all lead to the same place. No. <laughs> it's different right? in presentation. It, that's yeah, it. That, that's the difference. Is yeah. Just like the difference between a bad guy and a villain is presentation. Sure. Um, is because you have, like... They were the same thing. Yeah, it, it's, just, it's just behind that... It's behind the screen, right? Mm -hmm. um, however, I don't think necessarily that two locked doors and one open door is a railroad. I think it's just good dungeon design by an evil mastermind. Mm. Or it can be. And... So you can, this is something I will say, you can justify pretty much any railroading that you do. Like, oh yeah, they're not going to be able to fly this maze because the wizard cast this big gale above the, above the wall. So they can't just fly over it kind of right, thing. Right. And, it's, and it's like, technically that's a little bit of railroading yeah. because you're, you're taking a choice away from your players mm -hmm. in order that you're taking a tool out of their kit, basically. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you can justify it by being like, oh, this is a powerful arch wizard and he would know that people would try and circumvent his maze that way you know sure. kind of thing and they even do that in i think in um rise of tiamat when we you guys went into a maze at one point and i believe i remember that it said that anybody who tries to fly gets buffeted back down by mm -hmm. by heavy winds and, and it was like, like there's no saving like, this throw is, there's this no... is an official book and yeah. it's railroading you like yeah. and that's that's one way that you can be or that a dm will want to what railroad is when there's an adventure and they don't want to stray from that adventure, right? Yeah. I don't know that that's necessarily railroading too much. That's like making the characters be creative by taking away something that they maybe mm -hmm. rely on, or you yeah, know, it's just a challenge. Yeah, it's like putting it's putting like putting your players in darkness, right? Yeah, sure. There might be a difference between removing a choice and presenting no choice, right? Presenting mm -hmm. an obstacle, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. What do you think, Dallin? What, think why why do we do it, and and maybe when when is it appropriate, if ever? I mean, again, assuming that we're talking here about sort of gentle, light-handed yeah. <laughs> railroading, as opposed to the you know what I mean? Yeah, mm -hmm. I think a lot of times it happens because a DM didn't prep their session or mm -hmm. didn't have a lot of time to prep, so they're like, "This is what we're doing. This is all I have planned. Anything else, like, is off the table." Yeah, and it's either they're not good at improv or they don't want to be good at improv or maybe sure. they're scared of it or something sure. or maybe or, they're just tired or maybe they're just tired maybe <laughs> yes. they had a bad day and they're like you know what like this is what we're doing and like that's it yeah. sorry well i think uh, sorry i have more thoughts now now that you said that <laughs> <laughs> yeah go I, I do think that like a one shot for example yes that is a great time to railroad yes players. for sure also maybe it's the first session for a brand new player group mm -hmm. of players mm -hmm. they might not feel comfortable with just the grand expanse yes. and need a more linear story. Like. Yeah, right. No, I like that. I think that's that's. I shouldn't have gone last because those were my points. Oh, um, I do have one more. Pretend like I'm Corey. <laughs> I have one more situation <laughs> that would be appropriate to give that gentle railroading that we're talking about, and that's when a player has made a decision to end their character through through the bad ending, you know, the mm -hmm. violent act. Uh, or they, or there's some situation where you need something to happen in order to drive the story forward, mm -hmm. right? Like an NPC needs to die, which doesn't happen often. I like to make it so that there's always a chance to save that person, right? But at the same time, it's like if if uh, one of you came and said, I, I can't play anymore, we need to kill my character off, and we get into the session and the big bad is like holding that character up by the neck and somebody goes, uh, I'm gonna go ahead, ahead and cast a dimension door on the guy or teleport right, on him right, so right. that he, he goes away or something like that. And it's like, mm, no, he he counters it. Yeah. Well, I thought he was out of spell slots. I've been counting. No, he counters <laughs> it. Like you have, like there are, there are sure. certain narrative situations where you have to kind of take the plot by the reins and make it a little bit more cinematic than it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I gaming. think I think there's still ways as a DM to do that softly mm -hmm. and just be like, no, you can't do that. And yeah, be like, sure. Yeah, he counter spells never, never when then it's like, no. Right. Yeah, never just be like, n flat out no. Yeah, I mean, right. there's ground rules, whatever. But but yeah, you don't want to break it's like, the okay, immersion fine. too much. Yeah. You teleport, you cast that and he's out of saves, so he teleports off. 
but you know, there were 60 feet in the ground and now he falls and dies. Mm -hmm. So he's going to die yeah. from that anyways. Yeah. Yep. So sure. there's more creative. Yeah. Like it's your job as the DM yeah. to find the or right you can just fit there. <laughs> <laughs> like, like That's if, uh, if somebody's trying to teleport away and somebody else casts counter spell to keep them from teleporting away, for right. example, you can just fudge the number if you want. That's right. True. And say, Oh yeah, they made that saving throw against your counter spell. So they teleport away. That's and true. then you have to go on a hunt across the sea and find the Dagon and you know, yeah. and all this other <laughs> stuff. Just don't tell your players that you're doing it. Exactly. <laughs> um, hey, you, you rolled, and we're just yep. barely you off were just on barely that one. Barely off on that one. I want to let it happen. <laughs> so, yeah, this is tough, I think, because, you know, I think we all like to think, and rightly so, that D that D and D is is a game, but is also like a communal storytelling session, mm -hmm. right? Where there are rules, but also it's kind of like improv comedy plus action plus drama, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's what makes it so great. And so on the one hand, I think as a player, you want to feel empowered to be able to kind of make your own choices, right. do your own things. And you want, you want the game and the story to be a series of yes and moments and not just being told what to do or being told what you can or can't do, right? At the same time, the DM has sort of a, a unique position, right? In that they might not necessarily be the storyteller because mm -hmm. you're all sort of the storytellers, but they're sort of the main storyteller. Yeah, or, director. Or, mm -hmm. Yeah, the director is probably a better way to think about it. And sometimes, right, like in the name of telling a good story, the DM might have to step in and say, Okay, I'm gonna make a directive decision here, right? And mm -hmm. and not maybe phrase it that way, but yeah, do some nudging and some moving, right? Yep. And and I think as players, it's important for us to be okay with that, right? And be comfortable with it. Now, obviously there are like we've kind of been talking about, there are levels of, you know, heavy handedness and sometimes it's overdone, sometimes it's maybe too frequent. It can be frustrating if you are a player, I imagine to feel like you don't really have any choice and you're just kind of like in the train and like doesn't matter what you do at the end you're going to end up in the same place that you went were yeah. headed anyway you know etc cetera, etc cetera. and that nothing you you do really matters and so let's maybe let that segue into the the next question which is okay how can we do this in a way that doesn't feel heavy-handed that does feel like a light touch a soft touch um, and, and we've kind of talked about some of the how already, um, but I want to get into it a little bit more. You know, what what suggestions would you have for a DM who feels like I need to nudge this in a certain way or I need to maybe block off this option for my players, mm -hmm. um, but do it in a way that doesn't make them feel like they're being railroaded. Like they're, they're still a, a, an important, not just passenger on a, on a on a train but um a contributor to the story right um in, in addition to to maybe suggestions that you've already made what what suggestions would you guys have i think it depends this is why session zero is important we always talk about that depends on your yeah. players if, and maybe that's something you talk about how much railroading versus sandbox do you want do you want full open story where you're finding every you know breadcrumb or whatever on your own and you're concocting your own story or do you want a little bit of like here's the guide do what you want but here's mm -hmm. the guide and I think most players would probably lean towards that like they want some sense of direction yeah. not necessarily like I'm hand holding you right. through the whole thing but like right. I definitely have plans for the story yeah. and I, I as the DM have an ending in mind so that this is some satisfying story um, and I think most players want that I would say I think I, I'm right there. I, yeah, I you know, it makes me think of, and we've had this conversation before, Dallin, where, like, there are some video games, for example, that are very like sandboxy, open world, yeah, um, Elder Scrolls type yeah, games, mm -hmm. right? And then there are some role playing games that are very like, mm, yeah, like you're pretty much this is your path, and there's yeah. not a lot of deviation. Yeah, you have a few choices for your own moral character right, in there, right. um, and. Personally, I tend to 
to be someone who like like when I play a, a game that's super like open world, go wherever you want, do wherever you want. So overwhelming. I do. I, I get a little at first it's really exciting and I'm like <gasps> Look like, at that I can go Look at that anywhere. Thing. I can do yeah. anything. Frolic with the fairies. And, <laughs> and I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to make my character like that, and da-da-da-da. And after a few hours, it's like, I'm bored. Yeah. Because, <laughs> like, like, I I want, no I want to be told a good story. I like to participate in the story, too. Yeah. And that's what's so great about D&D. But I also, like, I love, I love a good yarn. And mm-hmm. sometimes, like, maybe left to my own devices... The yarn's not going to be as good. It's not might not be as interesting. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so I like to know that there is sort of like like a central villain, maybe. You know what I mean? And and like a crisis that needs to be solved, and that it's that that there's maybe a path to get there. Now there might be several paths to get there. Yeah. But still, like I want an overarching story. Now, mm-hmm. not everybody. Uh, you know, is me, right? Not everybody maybe feels that way. I'm sure there are plenty of players that play D&D that are like, no, man, like, I want to go wherever I want and do whatever I want. If I want to get in a bar fight and, well, and that's that's a bad example. If I want to, you know, if I want to take sides with the villain and try and conquer the world, mm-hmm. like, I want to be able to do that or, you yeah. know, whatever. Or I want, uh, maybe I just want to start a merchant business, you know, and, sure. and forget all of this adventuring Playing stuff sure, right at the beginning. And it's just like, <laughs> Okay, all right. As a DM, like that's that's gonna be a, like that takes time. Uh, so a couple things that I would say is number one, make your your uh, the better choice, the one you want, more appealing mm. to your players, right? Mm. Like be like, oh yeah, you've got two quests up on the quest board right now. One of them is to get spider fangs, and it's about a gold per spider fang, you know. Or there's this other one that has this bounty on his head for this knoll, and it's 100 gold pieces per person mm-hmm. in the party. Your party's going to be like, let's go for the spider fangs. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're going to go for the knoll. Yeah. Preston would. Preston would definitely yeah. be like, I mean, mm-hmm. he has use for the spider fangs. He's going to make daggers. Right? Yeah, yep. Preston would be like, well, my character has like... His backstory is heavily this related to spiders. fear of spiders, yeah. and, and in order to overcome them, he needs to face these mm-hmm. spiders and conquer his <laughs> and then And then yeah. as a DM, it's my job to go, oh, well, you look, and they're actually in the same forest. What? Who to thunk it? You know, kind of thing. And that's another thing that you can do is like if they have multiple things that they want to do, just kind of group them together. A sure. Little bit. Like, sure. It makes it a lot easier for your players to be like, yeah, we know where we want to go because it's all in that area. You know, and it's a que- it's a quest hub, and they all lead you to a specific right. quest area, right? Take and I take a lot of examples about like questing and and adventuring from video <laughs> games. And I think that's one of the that's one of the, like the driving things that kind of helps my players ease into my worlds a little bit more is mm-hmm. they know that they know that like around the next corner they're gonna find their next step and, mm-hmm. and be able to move on. But they can always diverge and they'll eventually find their way to the main plot. Yeah, I think there's something to be said for and and maybe maybe this is a tri- a tip from a player perspective for a DM to 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 be willing to in that scenario maybe say okay like they really want to go for the spiders like mm-hmm. i'm just going to let it happen yep. and and maybe maybe that means your main story is delayed by a session and so be it right you might or go off and have entirely, an amazing yeah. like, well, it, it can come back later. so yeah you never so, know um this is a little bit of an insight into my own damning style here is i leave things very nebulous out like I have a I have kind of the overarching brushstrokes of like what I want the plot to be Mm -hmm. but then I let my players choices kind of narrow that in sure and there are there are things and there are things in Tales of Venaria that I I hadn't figured out until two sessions before we actually went there right and so I like to I like to (laughs) Kind of railroad, but also I'm planting the rails literally ahead of the party like as they're traveling. Like Fifty along. feet ahead. Exactly. John Henry. <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm John Henry Irons, just going away there. Yeah. Um, I think as far as it goes, though, like if my players decided they want to go after the spiders, and I, and I was like, okay, well, I've got a little bit prepared, but you know what? Let's just kind of go crazy. Mm-hmm. Let's just see what I can come up with. And then you you introduce this whole new spider villain, and then and then they're like, oh, we need to go hunt them down in the underdark. It's like, okay, all right. And here's here's the next thing is as a player, be willing to accept the DM going, all right guys, I need Give to stop here. Yeah, yeah, or I need to take a break so that I can come up with something, or I need to stop the session here for tonight. So sorry that right. we got to cut it early, but 
But I really, you wanted to go for the spiders. Yeah, I really hadn't had this planned. <laughs> so let me, yeah. So yeah. let me, you know, give me some time, sure. you know, and we'll meet up next week, and I'll have a, a new grand adventure for you. Sure. Yeah. Agreed. I think the way that I plan a session is kind of similar. So I'll do, well, first, obviously, I'll have like my major plot points for the whole campaign, like mm-hmm. at least what I think it could be. Like I know I have this villain, and X is going to happen. That triggers the event that causes everybody to now want to go on the quest or whatever. Yeah. So like I usually get about that much. But session per session, I try not to go more than a session, maybe a session and a half ahead mm-hmm. because I don't want to do all that work to have somebody not go down that path, yep. right? right, and right so right. typically I'll let the players inform how I plan my next session. Mm-hmm. Kind of like what you were saying. Like, okay, yeah. they chose the spiders. Great. Then next session I'll build something around the spiders. Or yep. they chose it on the fly and I'm not ready okay, I have kind of an idea of a session. I'll just, now it's spider, so let me just look up the stat blocks really quick and I'll kind of adjust what yeah. I'm doing here. Yeah, you can absolutely do that. You can take your 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 null encounter and turn it into a spider right. you know, dungeon or whatever right. really easily. True. Sure. And I think um, the best thing to do if you're just getting into DMing is don't write out like, here's what the, this person says when they get to them, here's what this description is. Right. Just go, come up with like, a half dozen to a dozen different places and a quick description of them. You know, if they're going to a town, what does the tavern look like? What does the library look like? What does the mayor's house look like? You know, kind of thing. And then as far as <laughs> characters go, just go like, okay, here's a, here's a character. Here's some character traits for him. Here's some goals that he has. You know, do the whole like um, flaws and bonds that you can do yeah, as mm-hmm, a player. Mm-hmm. Do that with NPCs. And that way you can have a, a quick idea of what a specific character how it's going to react to the party yeah. instead of just being like he says this to you right. and then they go what else and he goes uh, uh, he says this to you he again said, because yeah, yeah, yeah. he's the one got the one dialogue yeah. Yeah. don't the, be a video game the, 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 the reason that the reason that Don and Tori just looked at me <laughs> like that was because <laughs> I was telling them about a conversation I'd had earlier today with um, someone who's going to be sponsoring uh, several videos coming up in the next uh, few weeks um, it's a tool to help DMs be able to do that kind of stuff. The the, the description, uh, oh, yeah. like on the like fly. yeah on the fly. Like oh, I need like half a dozen descriptions of like you know a few different locations that my players might yeah. end up going to. Or if they pick a seventh one that I didn't prepare, mm-hmm. like use this tool that can give you some on the fly description, which is really cool. Stay tuned next week uh, for what that sponsor is. Yeah, and it's very it's very cool to do. Like there's so many resources out there that you can use. Uh, the DMG alone has a bunch of random generators. Yeah. For you, mm-hmm. right? Like, in, yeah, they're <laughs> random. They're just like, open up the book and make a random dungeon out of it, kind yeah. of thing, in five minutes. Yeah, which is really cool. But I think that the community is where you want to go. Go to go to the D and D Reddit or go to Google, obviously, and and ask ask Google directly, like right. how to create a character in five seconds or character generator or something like that, mm-hmm. and you'll be able to get something just in a snap. Yeah. yeah, and I'd say too, as a DM, don't be afraid to like if you if they. Go interact with an NPC and you didn't really have anything prepped, you know, have have just a rough idea of what they are, go with that. Mm-hmm. And then if that character becomes somebody more popular that the party's gonna be at interacting with more, Which or now a quest giver or whatever, you can flush that out later. For the time being, it can be like, okay, this is what he's like now. Mm-hmm. I'll get his motivations and his everything else as it becomes yep. important sure. to and the that, story. And that may take a little retconning down the line, which sure. happens, again, with the way that with the way that I run my games, it's very nebulous, so it's, it's always a, like, okay, well then I'm gonna change this to be this, but that doesn't really, un, like, it doesn't make sense with this character motivation here, but eh, we'll just worry about that later, like if somebody asks about it, you know? Because yeah. chances are your players aren't gonna remember half of the plot points that you <laughs> give them anyway. So. Some of them <laughs> remember much better than others. Yes. Because mm-hmm. they take notes and they're not. Yeah, what was their exactly. name again? <laughs> Blabbity Blue. No, Sounds then, right. <laughs> Blabbity, Blabbity Blue. Then you just make a character that that's part of their stick. They mm-hmm. don't remember names very well and it works <laughs> great. <laughs> Problem is, next character, I'm going to be like, i got to come up with a different reason for why I can never remember anything. <laughs> he has yeah. short, yeah. 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 short-term memory loss, you yeah. know. <laughs> um, all right, what do you think, Tori? Any additional... Um, Tips for DMs on, this or and or players. Right. Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. I, I, we our <laughs> expectations are very high. <laughs> I don't have any other tips. <laughs> oh, no. um, I think they covered it well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just use your best judgment. I be think. willing to be flexible. 
Yeah. And as a player, be willing to be flexible. Too. Absolutely. Like some if 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 your DM's doing the railroading too hard, mm-hmm. talk to them talk about to it. Them. Yeah. Obviously, that's what we always recommend. Communication. But if like the DM's like, oh yeah, this magical maze, you can't break through the walls and you can't fly. Don't be like you're railroading us and I'm not having fun. Be like, yeah. this is a new challenge and I have to figure out what to do here. Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. Be willing to give them the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, yeah I w- sure. I would say just la- I guess last thoughts is like. As a DM doing the whole two choices, one's more appealing than the other, don't make it so unappealing that it's like they're going to just wipe or die. Yeah, like yeah, it's yeah. a TPK or the, this is the path because yeah, that's yeah. like not a good <laughs> Sure. Don't, that sucks. don't have Spider things are in a bog of poo. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or you're surrounded by a bunch of ogres and bandits and it's either go with the, the bandit lord and talk with him <laughs> or get into this huge or fight. Or die. Yeah, or, and, uh, and possibly die. That doesn't die. necessarily have to end in a TPK. No. There's a way out probably. It's but called that's running on you away. As yeah, team. but and, uh, run, here's we all know how running away. Yeah. Players hate to run away. Yes. They're not going to run away. Yep. So come, come up with Plan C. For that scenario. We call it As the a ex machina. <laughs> that's one. Run, that's or... one option. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. There's there's things out there. But as a DM, that's your job, and yeah. yep. you'll you'll have to figure that out on your own, I guess. Uh, I think every DM does it a little different and kind of leans on different tools or different tropes to get through that. And I don't know that there's one necessarily right way to do it. Right. So. And 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 I guess I would say to like, uh, for 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 dms from a player perspective like um we've kind of mentioned this already but you know be willing to kind of go with it i i'm just thinking of um but one of my favorite moments from uh the bronze battalion campaign that we did was uh when and we've talked about this before on the show i think (laughs) but like yeah cory (laughs) cory's character like saw this horn that was on an npc and the horn was apparently very important to Corey's character. No, it was stolen from Mike. That's right, it was stolen. Yeah, it was bumped into you in the street. Yeah, and it, yeah. was, it was really and, important to the character. And I don't know, Dallin, and you don't have to answer this question. It's fine. I like I like not seeing behind the curtain, oh. right? Like I I I, I don't boss, want the great. And yeah, powerful. exactly. Like I just want to <laughs> see the great and powerful. I don't want to yeah. see the man behind the curtain. Yeah. So anyway. Um, He's old and frail, and we hate him. And yeah. <laughs> uh, do not hate him. No, we don't. He's a lovely person. But so the horn was stolen, and, and I'm, I'm quite sure that Dallin had something very different planned for the session that night, but Corey was like, I'm going to get that horn back, and like I'm going to find out who took it. And and he, and he like the whole session was like, find the horn. And, and, and there was this NPC that we ended up finding it on yeah. that was like an important NPC. And I don't NPC. know, again, don't tell me, I don't know if the NPC was supposed to be a villain in our campaign, <laughs> yes. but they kind of ended up becoming one. <laughs> Not the way Not that for very long. Well, <laughs> right, right. They because, were... yeah, then we ended up finding the horn that she had, yeah. and then we, like, fought her and killed her, and we were like, holy cow, we just killed the captain of the city guard. Like, <laughs> yeah. that was, and, uh, again, I don't... Evil. <laughs> Some of us tried to save her, <laughs> I don't think, to be fair. I don't think a lot of that was planned, but it was also, like, one of maybe the better moments in that campaign, mm-hmm. I think, it, being able to have a DM just go... All right, like we're gonna run with no, this, I, I guess. Like this is what we're Dallin doing, you know saying, what I mean? Okay. <laughs> okay. Give me a and, second here. And, and there were, and there have been similar, there have been similar moments in Tales mm-hmm. of Anaria too, like where yeah, yeah. Corey sort of is like under his breath, like, oh, I didn't think it was gonna go this way tonight, yeah. but I guess like this is what's gonna happen. Yeah. And then it ended up being like a really cool moment, even if we almost died. Yeah, you guys uncovered a villain that was supposed to be a breadcrumb. I didn't realize the horn was so important to you. Yeah. That was going to be a villain later. You just unearthed that really fast. Mm-hmm. And you picked the wrong item, really that's for sure. <laughs> and that's fine. That's, yeah, you know, that's stolen the, the, the coin would purse. Yeah. <laughs> would have been fine. The, yep. the point was they were going to steal the horn and plant it on a dead body and frame you. Yeah. And you're like... No, this is not happening. I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. let's let it. Let's yeah, let this like, go out. Let's yeah, like literally the only item that that character would have hunted down to the ends of the earth. Yeah, but and I think I think that's great. And I always like I always reference uh, when I I randomly put a hag in, as an extra monster in to this encounter, and the hag escapes after you defeat the actual encounter, and she was just supposed to be there to like pepper you guys, and then and then Colby's character jumps off the barge and is like. Forget it. We're running into the woods after her. Like yeah. we need, we need to get that XP, you yeah. know, or or find out what's <laughs> going on. Well, yes, it was, it was story motivated. Miniature, 
<laughs> session, yes. right? Where yep. we all got mini down. Yep. And that, so that was that, awesome. That led to that one of the fun. best sessions that you guys had yeah. from yeah. what you've told me. Yeah. So going off the rails can be is, rewarding. It can be great. Yeah. So don't be afraid of it yeah. as a DM. Um, obviously, you know, the more experience you have, the more comfortable you'll be with doing that. Find tools that can help yeah. you kind of get comfortable. But, but you know, I, I think your suggestion was a good one. Don't be afraid to tell your players, okay, like we're going a different direction than I had thought. You guys give me a minute and let yeah. me like figure out what's, mm-hmm. what, yeah. what we're going to do. 10 minutes to run upstairs and yeah. you just like grab, you grab a, qu- a quick couple maps off of online, you know, kind of thing. And then you come back down and you're like, okay, I'm ready to go. And your players just get 10 minutes to just chat yeah. and plan their next move. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Well, thanks guys. Thank you for watching. Appreciate having you. Love you guys. And uh, hope you have a fantastic day. Thanks to my DMs, as always, for what is always a lively and entertaining conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, Have a great day. Hope to see you again soon. Be sure to check out the rest of the content on the channel and like it, subscribe and and all those things. Have a good one, guys. We'll see you soon. (laughs) And basically, it's a tool to. I'm gonna just mute that really quick. <laughs> Beep. Hello, I'm Corey, the DM. <laughs> <laughs> this is totally going into the outtakes, by the way. And yeah. Uh, yeah. And <laughs> just, just, and just gonna caress that like button. You should too. <laughs> don't, you don't need to caress it. You can just. If you caress it, you get push. three wishes. Just one push. Ooh, yeah. From Colby directly. <laughs> <laughs> Just mm-hmm. that's good to cut. Hi. <laughs> that's Hello. Honest, I'm right. sorry, and I have a game for us to play. <laughs> I'm so nervous to see what those wishes are. Yep. Do you are mean like the, the build underperformed or uh, just both. the okay. All both. right. Yeah. Um and <laughs> sorry. And wow. something inappropriate that I will maybe that I'll something maybe say for the blooper reel. Underperforming yep. in that bed. has to do with like uh, some sort of pill that you might want to take. But anyway. Mm-hmm. Monk mm-hmm. E D medicine. Yes. Yeah. Um okay, so but let me get my notes back. Um Okay. Here's how the spell is worded. <laughs> And for those who can't translate, that means um, ED standing for think fast. Extra defensive attacks. Mm -hmm. Extra disadvantage. (laughs) Extra disadvantage. (laughs) Okay. Let's jump into the main topic. Nope. Let's jump. Let's take a deep dive into the... I'll figure it out. The sound effect needs to be like, like someone jumping into a pool. (laughs) Tori's just like, this is getting worse. She's like, I don't like this conversation. It needs to be something other than ED. You can have um, dysfunction at the end. It can be D. (laughs) 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 Headphone warning. Sorry. I'm so sorry. That was really loud. I apologize. Uh, Well, obviously, key point dysfunction. Yeah, but Mm -hmm. it starts with an E. Key function. Key dysfunction. Key D. Key D. Key D. There there we go. Is that what I sound? Is that your impression of me? No, my impression of you is like, hi guys, I'm Corey, your friendly DM. Everyone loves me because I'm so friendly. <laughs> wow, I'm very conceited, aren't I? There you have How it. How does Kobe feel? So good. 